I started on a mission to find out the best methods to make GP on old school RuneScape. And after searching high to low, asking players in game, and trying a wide variety of methods myself, I proudly introduce to you 100 ways to make GP on old school RuneScape. <laughs> The goal of this video is simple. Make the most relevant, compact money-making guide to where you can always come back if you want an idea to make your next millions or billions of GP. And before we start, I'm gonna be tossing one of you a full melee training kit. Just like the video, comment your RuneScape name below. Be sure to be subscribed and join my Discord server where I help new members every week. Now let's begin, starting with gathering. Picking up swamp toads near the Grand Tree is a very profitable method that has no requirements. What you wanna do is bank in the Grand Tree, then run over to the Swamp Toad spawn, pick them up, run back, and repeat. I also suggest you pick up the King Worms as well, as they can sell for more than a regular Swamp Toad, making you a nice profit. Now, once you've got the Swamp Toads, you'll want to turn them into Frog Legs by clicking on them, which almost doubles their value, making you over 300,000 GP per hour. Buying from the general store. Go to the general store in Varrock and buy hammers, tender boxes, and chisels. These items are bought for extremely cheap and can be sold sometimes for 100x what you paid. Once you buy out all the stock, hop to another world, buy out their stock, and continue that until you have to bank and repeat, making you 150 to 200k per hour. Buying pink skirts and aprons. Go to the clothing store in Varrock and buy pink skirts along with brown and white aprons. This method is very similar to the general store buying method where you buy out the stock in each world and then hop. The profits per item is slightly better, making you sometimes up to over 100 GP per item, equating to around 150 to 200k per hour. Buying toy horses. Toy horses are obtainable in Draenor Village and offer huge profit margins per purchase. In this run, I spent 4.1k and made 7.2k total, equaling 3.1k profit per inventory. Just continue to buy out the stock in each world, bank, and repeat. With a lot of the time, the toy horse is selling in the GE for over their stated value, earning you over 300,000 GP per hour. Gathering snake grass on Waterbirth Island is another awesome no requirement method that can make you up to 400k per hour. Just use a house in World 330, teleport to Waterbirth Island, and start picking up snake grass. Keep hopping worlds once you clear a world out, fill your inventory, bank, and then repeat. You'll have to sometimes compete with bots, so keep that in mind when choosing this method. Gathering Mortmire Fungus. Mortmire Fungus is another great way to gather yourself some GP. The spot I use for overall collection speed is three logs slightly southeast of fairy ring bkr collecting mortmire fungi is profitable as it is the secondary ingredient for making super energy potions you use a silver sickle b to cast bloom by the logs and the fungus will spawn each cast with the sickle will reduce your prior points by one to six and you can bank at castle wars with a ring of dueling and restore prior points at either your own player owned house or in a house party world 330. I suggest if you have low prayer level, you should bring a prayer potion or two, and this method would make you 500k GP per hour. Now, I feel like this wouldn't be a complete money-making guide if I didn't include a few alternative methods. One way players make a lot of GP without necessarily playing a game is by entering giveaways that usually occur on YouTube videos, streams, social media posts, or Discord servers. Here's an example of a giveaway-based Discord server that gives hundreds of millions of GP, if not billions of GP away weekly. Every Everything they do is completely free to enter, and they also track any Twitch streamers that have giveaway in their title and have a notifier for anyone who's interested in that type of content. I'll leave a link in the description for those of you guys who want to join and have a passive way to make some GP. Buying climbing boots. Obtaining climbing boots only requires completion of the Death Plateau quest. To start, teleport to Birthrope with a games necklace and run north of the Warriors Guild south of Death Plateau to Tenzing. At maximum speed, one full run should take no more than three minutes. Once you make it to Tenzing's, press one and spacebar repeatedly until your inventory is filled with climbing boots. Then, use your game's necklace once more to teleport to Barbarian Outpost, deposit your boots, and repeat, making you over 400k GP per hour. Collecting fish food. Fish food is used in the Ernest the Chicken quest. What you want to do is pick up the fish food in Draenor Manor and hop to the next world. It takes 60 seconds to respawn, so hopping is always best. Bank in Draenor Village, run back, and repeat. Then once you're satisfied, sell to the Grand Exchange for 130k per hour. Collecting monk robes. The Edgewood Monastery has a full set of monks' robes spawn on a table southeast of the upstairs section of the monastery. The robe pieces will spawn after 60 seconds, but I recommend hopping worlds to collect them faster. Each 
roll bottom is worth 99 GP and each top is worth 419 GP. So it may be worthwhile to only collect the more expensive of the two. Energy potions are recommended because of the amount of running you would have to do from the bank to the monastery and back. This method brings in a total of 123k per hour. Gathering Jangor Berries. The berries respond about as fast as you can collect them. And since they are currently worth 278 coins, collecting them can be fairly profitable. The fastest way to collect Jangor Berries is to start at the Castle Wars lobby, taking your rope out of your bank and running straight east to the island. Then use the rope on the tree branch jumping over to the island. Run in a circle continually collecting the berries, and when your inventory is full, teleport back to the lobby with a ring of dueling, bank, and repeat for 153k per hour. Collecting Red Spider Eggs. There are six egg spawns in Edgefield Wilderness Dungeon where we will be heading, and it is dangerous, so you should not take anything you are not prepared to lose. Make sure to beware of player killers at all times, and by using a looting bag which can be obtained by killing foes in the wilderness, you can quickly collect the Red Spider Eggs with ease and simply return to Edgeville with an Amulet of Glory to bank for 268k per hour. Collecting Planks. Planks worth 293 GP each are used in the early levels of construction. With that said, there is good money in collecting the four planks that spawn outside the Barbarian Agility course. And by utilizing world hopping, it's easy to amass large amounts of planks in a very short amount of time, making you 175k per hour. Collecting Bananas. Bananas can be picked in the Banana Plantation on Musa Point. By far the simplest way to get there is with an Amulet of Glory, which places you steps from the banana trees. Start out with 23 baskets in your inventory with a charged Amulet of Glory and a Ring of Dueling equipped, and start picking bananas from the trees. Each one has exactly 5 bananas, which is the number needed to fill a basket. After picking each tree clean, fill your basket, and move on to the next one. When all 23 baskets are full, use your Ring of Dueling to teleport to Castle Wars Bank, and repeat. Each trip takes about 4 minutes, so you can bank over 325 bananas per hour. These filled baskets will often sell for more than the bananas themselves, as they're used to protect curry trees and farming, amassing you 241k profit per hour buying monkey nuts. And yes, you heard that right. This method was super profitable. Salhib's food store carries monkey nuts between 3 and 14 GP each. Located just west of a bank makes it very easy to buy out the 200 nuts in stock. For even higher profits, wear a full graceful outfit and take one dose of a stamina potion every two minutes. This keeps run energy available all the time, and once a stock is depleted, hop worlds and repeat. Salhib will only trade you if you have Monkey Madness 2 completed or partial completion of Monkey Madness 1 to where you're able to equip a Monkey Grigri. The bank is only accessible once Monkey Madness 2 is completed, making you 925,000 GP per hour. Buying kegs of beer. Thora the barkeep in the Relica Long Hall Bar sells kegs of beer for 325 to 575 coins each. Kegs of beer boost your strength, but not enough to make them viable, so they're a novelty item to collect. This method purchases them from the shop and deposits them via Pier the Seer in the Relica Square. Approximately 100 inventories per hour are possible, making you 1.2 million GP an hour. Now it's time to get into the processing section of this video. And if you haven't subscribed yet, do so now because things are about to get even more awesome. Grinding Desert Goat Horns. Goat Horn Dust is used to create combat potions. Multiple horns can be ground in one game tick or they can be left to auto grind every three ticks. This results in anywhere between 1800 if you let it grind itself and 18,000 if you want to go with the higher intensity method horns ground per hour with profits ranging anywhere from 79,000 per hour to 792k per hour. Crushing Bird's Nests Crushed nests are used to create Ceradum and Bruce. Multiple bird nests can be crushed in one game tick, or they can be left to auto-crush every three ticks, just like the Desert Goat Horns. This results in anywhere between 2,000 and 5,000 nests ground per hour, with profits ranging from 420k to 1 mil per hour. To crush the nests, use them together with a Pestle and Mortar. Making Ranar Potions Ranar Potions are used to create Prayer Potions. Withdraw 14 Ranar Weed and 14 vials of water, and use one on the other. A manual open and click to make all. After the inventory is complete, you should be left with 14 unfinished Renar potions. Deposit your inventory, withdraw 14 herbs and 14 vials of water, and repeat. Each inventory should take about 13 seconds with banking, making you 952,000 GP. Making Avento potions, making Toad Flag potions, making Snapdragon potions, and making Quarm potions. All these methods are the same exact process, just with a different herb. Just withdraw 14 of the respective herb and 14 vials of water, and use one on another. I've currently put the hourly profit per method on the screen now.
Making Raw Summer Pies Raw Summer Pies are used to quickly train cooking and magic by using the Bake Pie spell. They are made by using the ingredients strawberry, watermelon, cooking apple, on a pie shell. In that order, buy an equal number of the previously mentioned supplies from the Grand Exchange. Withdraw 14 pie shells and 14 strawberries, and use one on another. This will bring up a menu to make part summer pies, so click to make all. Once you've made 14, bank them and repeat. When all of your strawberries and pie shells are gone, use the watermelons on the part summer pies in the same fashion, and then use the cooking apples on the part summer pies too to create raw summer pies. Up to 670 raw summer pies can be made per hour, making you 507k GP per hour profit. Dismantling Bracelets of Ethereum The Bracelet of Ethereum is a frequent drop from all types of revenants, but when dismantled, it will give you 250 revenant ether, equating into 1.8 million GP profit per hour. Begin by withdrawing 27 uncharged bracelets. And something to make this a lot quicker is adjusting your in-game controls under options to only allow one mouse button. You can then dismantle the last bracelet in your inventory quickly by using the number one key to approve the dismantle option. Each inventory should take about 25 seconds to dismantle and restock your inventory, allowing for about 130 inventories to be completed per hour. Opening Sinister Chests The Sinister Chest, located in the Yenil Agility Dungeon, always rewards nine noted herbs when opened. Three grimy Renar weeds, two grimy Harlander weeds, and one of each grimy Torsal, Irrit Leaf, Avento, and Guarn. Opening the chest requires a Sinister Key, and the key is used up when the chest is opened. Depending on the price difference between the keys and the herbs, it can be very profitable to buy sinister keys, open the chest, and sell the resulting herbs. Start out by teleporting to Yanel by whatever method you have and go to the Yanel Agility Dungeon entrance. Slash the web, go down the stairs, and across the agility ledge. Enter the obstacle pipe immediately next to you and open the chest at the end of the room, resulting in you being poisoned but walking away with 1.5 million GP per hour. Opening Crystal Chests The crystal chest located in Taverly always rewards an uncut Dragonstone when opened, as well as a variety of other items. Opening the chest requires a crystal key, and the key is used up when the chest is opened. Depending on the price difference between the keys and the loot, it can be very profitable to buy crystal keys, open the chest, and sell the resulting contents. Start out by teleporting to your player-owned house in Taverly. If you don't have it currently in Taverly, go to Varrock and switch it there. Go south and enter the building with the crystal chest. When you've used all your keys, teleport out using your choice of teleportation jewelry, bank the items, and repeat. Each trip takes approximately one to two minutes, making you 1.1 million GP per hour. Making Magic Pyre Logs A maximum of 2,700 Magic Pyre Logs can be made per hour by combining four doses of Sacred Oil and Magic Logs. In order to do this, first withdraw 14 Magic Logs and 14 Sacred Oil, and arrange them into one column of Magic Logs on the left, then a column of Sacred Oil, a column of Magic Logs, and a final column of Sacred Oil on the right. Make a snake pattern by clicking on the top left Magic Log, then the neighboring Sacred Oil. Upon opening the bank interface, only deposit the magic pyre logs, do not deposit the vials yet. Withdraw all magic logs, deposit the empty vials, then withdraw the sacred oil to keep your inventory the same for 200k per hour. Making Dragon Breath Potions Making Bottled Dragon Breath is very profitable. You can produce between 400 and 600 Bottled Dragon Breath in an hour, leading to between 817k GP and 1.2 million GP profit per hour, depending on your efficiency. In order to do this method, you need to use a vial with 10 Dragon Fruit to make one Bottled Dragon Breath unpowered, which can then be powered on a Sulfur Vent on Mount Karolm to create Charged Bottled Dragon Breath. And as a word of caution, you will take a small amount of damage during the process if you are not wearing Ice Gloves, Making Adamant Brutal Arrows Adamant Brutal Arrows are commonly used by players who are chompy bird hunting, usually to complete the Western Provinces Diary or to hunt for the elusive chompy chick pet. As they are stronger than the easier to acquire Ogre Arrow, many players choose to buy Brutal Arrows instead. This opens up an opportunity to make Adamant Brutal Arrows for profit. All you have to do is click together Ogre Arrow Shafts and Adamant Nails to make each Brutal Arrow. And as crafting 6 arrows takes 2 ticks, it is possible to craft 16,000 Adamant Brutal Arrows per hour with high enough intensity, making you 315k profit. Making Ultra Compost Ultra Compost is the highest level of compost and is an essential component of high-level farming. Due to its high demand, it often sells for more than the Grand Exchange Guide price, so profit calculations may vary wildly. This method involves creating Ultra Compost by using Volcanic Ash on Super Compost. Each Ultra Compost takes two Volcanic Ash and one Super Compost to create. Creating Ultra Compost uses the standard crafting dialog, so it is possible to process a whole inventory of 27 without having to manually click each time. A full inventory 
inventory takes about 36 seconds, meaning it is possible to process about 100 inventories per hour, making you 424k per hour, making Redwood Prior Logs. As I mentioned earlier when making Magic Prior Logs, the inventory arrangement and method of withdrawing and depositing from the bank are both very important for reaching a fast output rate. First, withdraw 14 Redwood Logs and 14 Sacred Oil and arrange them into one column of Redwood Logs on the left, then a column of Sacred Oil, a column of Redwood Logs, and a final column of Sacred Oil on the right. Make a snake pattern by clicking the top left Redwood Log, and then the neighboring Sacred Oil, then the Sacred Oil below, and the Redwood Log to the left, and so on. Crossing over at the bottom and then going up. This minimizes the amount the mouse must move, maximizing output. Upon opening the bank interface, only deposit the Redwood Prior Logs. Do not deposit the vials yet. Withdraw all Redwood Logs, deposit the empty vials, then withdraw the Sacred Oil. The message, this Sacred Oil doesn't seem fresh, you should make your own, will be shown if you have not finished the Shades of Morton quest, which is needed to make Prior Logs in general, and make you this very sweet 1.4 million GP per hour profit. Charging and alking the Bracelet of Ethereum. The Bracelet of Ethereum is a frequent drop from all types of revenants. When charged with any amount of revenant ether, its high level alchemy value raises to 45,000 GP, but it becomes untradeable. Profit can be made by buying uncharged bracelets off the Grand Exchange, charging each one with one single ether, and alking the charged bracelet. Begin by withdrawing 27 uncharged bracelets and one ether. Use the ether on one of the bracelets, withdraw one more ether and use it on the next bracelet, and so on until you have 27 charged bracelets in your inventory. Then withdraw 27 or more nature runes and cast high level alchemy on each bracelet. Repeat this for as many inventories as you wish. It is not recommended to bank any of the charged bracelets as they do not stack in the bank. Each inventory should take about three and a half minutes to charge and alk with decent concentration, allowing for you to be able to complete 17 inventories an hour for a profit of 570k. Grinding Unicorn Horns. Unicorn Horn Dust is used to create anti-poison and super anti-poisons. Multiple horns can be ground in one game tick where they can be left to auto grind every three ticks. This results anywhere between 1800 idle and 18,000 high intensity horns ground per hour with profits ranging from 64k to 684k per hour. To grind the horns, use them together with a pestle and mortar. It will slowly grind the unicorn horns one by one. So the speed can be significantly increased by grinding each horn manually. Doing this may be easier by placing the pestle and mortar next to the last horn in your inventory, reducing the distance you need to move your mouse and making you more GP. Making pie shells. Processing pie shells can be a profitable free-to-play method of making money, but also a viable method to make some GP in members if you so choose. After buying a large quantity of pastry dough and pie dishes, the procedure is as followed. You want to withdraw 14 pastry dough and 14 pie dishes. Hold down your space bar and then click the pastry dough and pie dish together. Release your space bar once the shells start being made and wait until the inventory completes. Deposit your pies and repeat for 250k per hour. Filling bullseye lantern. Filling bullseye lantern empties with lamp oil is a simple process of putting swap tar into a lamp oil still. The one we'll be using is located in the chemist's house in Remington. To do the method, swap tar must be used on a lamp oil still, then a lantern on the lamp oil still each time to fill them. With a player-owned house in Remington, you can quickly get to the chemist's house after teleporting to a bank. Bullseye lanterns weigh a lot, so using a graceful outfit is good at maintaining run energy for 723k GP per hour. Crafting limestone bricks. At 12 crafting, you can craft limestone bricks by using a chisel on limestone. There is no make X menu, each is crafted one by one, but multiple can be crafted in a single tick, making you 445k per hour at a good speed. Cutting Amethyst Arrow Tips Amethyst Arrow Tips are attached to headless arrows to make Amethyst Arrows, which have plus 6 higher range strength bonus than Rune Arrows, making them a good alternative in PvP and PvM. It can be unbelievably profitable to cut Amethysts into Arrow Tips, and to do so, with a chisel in the inventory, you can withdraw 27 Amethysts at a time, each Amethyst becomes 15 arrow tips when chiseled, and it takes slightly over 30 seconds to cut an inventory of amethyst arrow tips. So the outcome will be upwards of 2,500 to 2,750 amethysts cut per hour for 434k profit. Moving us into the next section of this guide, the skilling section. This segment is all about making big GP and training your XP at the same time. You're going to really want to stay from now until the end of the video because I'm about to show some of the biggest, most profitable methods in all of RuneScape. Creating Gloves of Silence can make you 449k GP per hour. Just follow these steps. Equip the Ring of Dueling, drink one dose of Stamina Potion, teleport to Varrock, then run southeast, enter the gates, and then right-click Fur Clothing on Isoft. Right-click and select Buy 10 on the icon for Gloves of Silence underneath Dark Kebet. Do the previous step again and again. Teleport the Castle Wards to deposit the gloves and withdraw more furs, and repeat. Fletching Headless Arrows. Headless arrows are made by using feathers on arrow shafts, and they are used in fletching to create arrows for quick experience gains. They also can make 
make you 315k per hour. To create headless arrows, use the feathers on the arrow shafts. A menu will open up asking you how many you want to make. Click all, which will make 10 sets of 15 headless arrows. Each set of 150 takes about 12 seconds, so you can make more than 40,000 headless arrows per hour if you have enough materials. The coolest part about this method is not that you make money while scanning XP, but because making headless arrows does not require banking and only takes up three inventory spaces. It can be used in conjunction with many other money-making methods where there is a long wait between actions. Making Raw Admiral Pies This method will involve the assembly of Raw Admiral Pies, valued by players training magic with the Baked Pies spell. Begin by depositing the materials into a separate bank tab, then withdrawing 14 pie shells and 14 cooked salmon. Combine them by using the pie shell on the salmon. Next, withdraw 14 cooked tuna and combine them with the partially made pies. Be careful not to accidentally eat the salmon or the tuna during the combining process. Lastly, withdraw 14 raw potatoes and add them to the pies. Bank the resulting pies and repeat. With enough concentration, it is possible to produce around 840 pies per hour, making you 404k GP profit. Planting Mithril Seeds Did you ever think that you can make pretty decent GP while planting mithril seeds? Well, now you know you can. And here's how. The best place to plant mithril seeds is near a bank where the walls are two tiles from each other in east to west direction. This allows you to stay relatively near the bank, meaning faster banking and more profit per hour. A good example of this is the top floor of Lumbridge Castle. All that's needed to be done is clicking the seeds and pressing 1 for the fastest way to plant and pick up the flowers. Now what makes this method very interesting is the black flowers and white flowers are very uncommon. If these do not drop, the average profit per seed planted is minus 190 GP. But on average, if you plant mithril seeds for over an hour, you'll make around 400,000 GP profit. Charging Air Orbs Air Orbs are worth 1,089 coins each, and they are created by using the Charge Air Orb on the Air Obelisk with an unpowered orb in your inventory. With an Air Staff equipped, this requires 3 Cosmic Runes per cast, costing 279 coins. Using the Amulet of Glory to teleport to Edgeville for banking, you can charge up to 27 orbs per trip, resulting in a maximum profit of 18,000 coins per trip. However, due to run energy depletion, it can be more worthwhile if to withdraw 2 Energy Potion 4s and only charge up to 25 orbs per run. This method yields slightly lower profits per run at 16k, but enables higher overall hourly profit due to being able to consistently run. Each trip takes approximately 170 seconds, allowing 21 trips per hour. One trip uses about 75% energy without weight reducing clothing, and roughly 10% energy is recuperated while charging the 25 orbs. Consume 6 or 7 doses of energy potion per trip while running through the dungeon, and bank all leftover doses to be recombined later. Charging air orbs can make you 340k per hour. Last Man Standing A surprising one in the skilling section. Last Man Standing is a PvP-based minigame that can make you up to 1 mil per hour if you're very skilled, and much less if you aren't well-versed in PvP. Now, why I believe this could be one of the better money makers in OSRS? Because it will teach you the fundamentals of PvP while earning you some GP. Once you're more skilled in PvP, you can move on to some of the greatest money makers like high-level risk fighting. Hunting Implinks On a good day, hunting down Implinks can yield quite a bit of money for willing players. The best place to catch Implinks is in Puro Puro, which is got to by traveling to Lumbridge Swamp and entering the Lost City Shed with a Draymond or Lunar Staff equipped. Around 1 to 4 Dragon Implinks could be caught on a good hour, which could set the profit margin between 478k and 1.9 million GP per hour. However, you're likely to catch at least 1 per hour, and I advise that you also catch Nature, Magpie, and Ninja Implinks while hunting for Dragon Imps in order to sustain your profitability. Making Teak Planks Making Teak Planks is the exact same process as Mahogany, but switching to Teak Logs and using less cash per plank at just 500 GP each, which can be a good alternative for those of you who have lower cash stacks to work with, and you can make up to 300,000 GP per hour. Pickpocketing Hand Members You can pickpocket hand members at 15 Thieving. When pickpocketing hand members, you have a 1 out of 50 chance to obtain an easy clue scroll, and the expected value of an easy clue scroll is roughly 38,000 coins each. Most of the value of an easy clue scroll is driven by trimmed, gold trimmed bronze, iron, steel, black armor, cosmetic items, god pages, and some very rare items such as gold trimmed monk's robes and team cape zero. Now, at 92 thieving, you cannot fail pickpocketing hand members if you have the Ardone card diary completed. Alternatively, if you have 99 thieving and are wearing a thieving cape, you cannot fail either. As one pickpocket takes 1.2 seconds, it should take a bit over a minute on average to obtain an easy clue scroll. Now, with large amounts of teleports unlocked, an easy clue scroll can generally be completed in under 90 seconds if all easy stash are filled. The general strategy is to teleport to drain our village using 
an amulet of glory, running to the hideout which takes roughly 40 seconds, obtaining a clue scroll through pickpocketing and completing the clue scroll, banking in Draenor Village, then repeating the process. If you do not meet the requirements to pickpocket hand members without fail, you should wear a dodgy necklace and full hand robes to decrease the probability of being kicked out of the hideout when filling a pickpocket. Some cool information is at 18 easy clue scrolls completed per hour, an average profit can be expected of 584k. If you did 15 clue scrolls per hour, 486k can be expected. If you did 12 clue scrolls per hour, 389k can be expected, and 292k profit at 9 clue scrolls per hour. Making Mahogany Planks Making Mahogany Planks at the Sawmill is a decent way to make money. Each plank requires 1 Mahogany Log and 1,500 coins. The fastest way to get to the Sawmill is through the Balloon Transport System, which requires the completion of Enlighted Journey. Once you've unlocked the Varrock Route, requiring 40 Fire Making, you can fly to the Varrock Balloon just steps away from the Sawmill for 1 Willow Log. Each Balloon Transport System destination has a crate which may be used to store up to 100 logs of each kind. The logs may be brought noted to the crate for faster deposits. All the crates share the same inventory of logs. Make sure you have deposited at least 78 will logs in the storage crate. Begin at the Castle Wars lobby and withdraw 27 mahogany logs and at least 40,500 coins. Run north out of the lobby and north to the balloon and fly to Varrock. Run north to the sawmill operator and select buy plank and then buy all under the mahogany logs. Teleport back to Castle Wars with a ring of dueling, bank, and repeat the process for 350k per hour. Mining Runite Ore At 99 mining, GP rates can exceed 1.2 million GP per hour with optimal equipment and unlimited rocks between 8 and 10 world hops. However, Runite mining can be very competitive, even at the most remote locations. I advise to hop worlds every single time the ore is depleted in search of fresh rocks, which respawn every 12 minutes. A good tip is total level worlds such as 1750, 2000, and 2200 are more likely to contain unmined Runite rocks than non-total worlds. I mine my ores in the fight caves, which I found to be a very good spot and I made 730k per hour. Casting Plank Make. Completing Dream Mentor unlocks the Plank Make Lunar Spell. Auto casting Plank Make and banking with an inventory of 26 logs, coins, and a rune pouch takes a little over 90 seconds. This results in around 960 casts per hour and 90,000 magic experience per hour. Manual casting is significantly more click intensive but also faster. With manual casting, a full inventory can be processed in a little under 40 seconds, allowing for around 1900 and 50 casts per hour, making you up to 380k profit. Humidifying Clay Soft clay is often used by players training crafting, who wish to save the effort associated with wetting the clay themselves, putting soft clay in high demand. You can cast Humidify on an inventory of clay in the vicinity of a bank to wet high amounts of it quickly, but the process is highly click intensive. Use Astral Runes and equipped a Steam Battle Staff to maximize profit and efficiency. Then, withdraw 27 clay from the bank and press Escape. Cast your Humidify spell and spam click the bank. If you turn on XP drop, Click the bank as soon as the magic XP number goes off the top of the screen to open your bank quicker. Then deposit your inventory and withdraw another 27 clay and repeat. When playing at maximum efficiency, up to 815 spells can be cast per hour. For 22,000 soft clay produced, making you 467,000. GP profit. Enchanting Dragonstone Jewelry. To enchant Dragonstone, use the Dragonstone enchantment spell and click onto the item you're wanting to enchant for the fastest rate of enchantment, or let it auto enchant for a more relaxed moneymaker. Manually casting the enchant spell for a maximum of about 1900 casts per hour, or auto casting for approximately 800 casts per hour can make you 480k profit. Smithing Rune Items. Runeite bars can be smithed at 99 smithing into Rune 2 hand swords, Rune Plate Legs, or Rune Plate Skirts. Due to these items use in high level alchemy, they can be fairly profitable to make while also being low effort and giving you a decent amount of smithing experience. The optimal location to smith in free to play is the Varrock West Bank, and the optimal location for pay to play is in Prifidus, which is two ticks faster per inventory. To do this, simply withdraw a hammer and 27 runeite bars, run to the anvil, and begin smithing your item of choice. The rune items can be sold on the Grand Exchange or to other players for a slightly higher price. There are often players willing to buy them on World 308 around the Varrock anvils. A quick tip is the rate of items made per hour can be made quicker if you're wearing the smith's uniform obtained from giant's foundry each of the four pieces of the outfit gives a 20 percent chance to speed up smithing actions performed at an anvil by one tick up to a 100 percent chance with the full set making you up to 687,000 dp per hour growing saplings growing magic redwood celetrus dragon fruit you 
palm, and maple saplings are some of the easiest and best money makers in OSRS. And all that matters is your farming level. It's also helpful if you can cast humidity or not. To plant the seeds in the pots, use one of them on one another with a gardening trowel in your inventory. This produces a seedling. When all the plant pots are filled with seeds, cast humidify to water them. These watered seedlings will take approximately five minutes to turn into saplings, but this will happen even when banked. Repeating this process quickly will make around 1,700 saplings an hour. Saplings can also be watered with watering cans instead of the spell humidify. However, this makes the process far more click intensive and time consuming. Once you've finished making the saplings, sell them on the Grand Exchange. Maximize your profit by buying one sapling instantly and selling all of yours for slightly less than that. On average, magic saplings will make you 2.5 million per hour, redwood 3 mil per hour, celatrus 5.9 mil per hour, dragon fruit 4.9 mil per hour, yew 3.1 mil per hour, palm tree 2.7 mil per hour, and maple trees making you 1.9 million GP per hour. That's a lot of GP. Testing super glass make. The super glass make lunar spell can instantly turn an inventory full of sand and seaweed or giant seaweed into molten glass. On average, it will make 1.3 glass for every sand seaweed pair, or up to 1.6 glass per sand with giant seaweed. With intense focus, 600 casts per hour is achievable, with up to 1,000 being attainable at peak efficiency. This works out to around 78,000 to 110k crafting and 46,000 to 66,000 magic experience per hour. Withdraw 13 sand and 13 seaweed. Close the bank, activate the spell, and then bank using deposit all a few ticks before the end of the animation. You can open the bank one tick faster if you click the bank before the spell, but both clicks have to be done before the next game tick happens, making you 441k per hour. Hunting Carnivorous Chinchapas. Red Chinchapas are widely used for quickly leveling up ranged, keeping their market value quite high, and making it a very viable way to make money and train the hunter skill. A popular place to hunt them is south of the fairy ring code AKS, by the southwestern corner of the map. Around 220 Chinchapas can be caught per hour at low levels, but upwards of 340 catches can be made an hour at higher levels, making you up to 883k per hour. Hunting Black Chinchapas Black Chinchapas are widely used for quickly leveling up your range, and most players will make the majority of their profits training the hunter skill as a whole by catching them. Being in the wilderness, around 350 Chinchapas can be caught per hour, with minimal interference from PKers. Tanking gear such as Din's Bulwark and Kareil's Armor is highly recommended and provides huge defensive bonuses while escaping PKers along with activating protection prayers. A quick tip is PKers usually start attacking with magic to freeze you and or teleblock you, so I strongly advise to set protect for magic and protect item as your quick prayers before heading to the area and prepare to switch overheads according to their attacks. Also, to mention Augury or Mystic Might can help boost up defenses, further giving you a higher chance at making the maximum amount of 1.1 million GP per hour. Catching Dark Crabs. Dark Crabs are located in the resource area and are most easily accessed by using the Edgeville Lever. Using a lobster pot and dark fishing bait, when you're fishing at Dark Crab fishing spots, they never move. Fishing Dark Crabs is very low intensity, but since this is the wilderness, you must always be on guard. Once a full inventory has been caught, the dark crabs should be noted with piles costing 15k an hour at maximum intensity, making you over 220k per hour profit. Catching raw carabon. Fishing raw carabon requires raw carabwani as bait, which can only be caught at the Holy Lake, south of Tai Buana Village, next to Fairy Ring CKR. At 65 fishing, it will take on average 6.5 minutes to collect enough raw carabwani for one hour of fishing carabon. At 99 fishing, this will take about four minutes. I do recommend you fish the raw carabwani in bulk to avoid going back and forth excessively because raw carabwani stack. Go to the carabwani fishing spot in northeastern Karamja near Fairy Ring DKP. There are many routes for banking and returning depending on your account's progression, but at minimum, partial completion of Fairy Tale 2, Cure Queen, is recommended. The closest no requirement bank is in Shazian near Fairy Ring DJR, returning via the same Fairy Ring to make 220k per hour fishing raw carabwani. Cleaning grimy renarweed. Renarweed is in high demand to create prayer potions. It is is often profitable to clean the grimy herbs and sell them on the Grand Exchange. 28 herbs can be cleaned per inventory, and each inventory can take from 10 to 20 seconds. And it's as easy as just clicking on the herb to make 580k per hour. Fletching Ruby Bolts. Ruby Bolts can be used to create Ruby Bolts Enchanted, some of the most powerful ammunition in the game. It can be very profitable to fletch these bolts. To make them, you'll need Adamant Bolts and Ruby Bolt Tips. A menu will open up to make Ruby Bolts, click to make 10. Each set of 10 bolts takes 1.2 seconds, so 100 bolts takes 12 seconds in total. 
bolt. After every set of 100, use the tips on the bolts again and repeat. You can make up to 27,000 bolts an hour with this method, while also gaining impressive fletching experience as high as 170k per hour, whilst making 513k GP profit as well. Making Guthix Rests. The Guthix Rest is a potion which is commonly used in PKing. The process is as followed for 275k per hour profit. Use a bowl of hot water on an empty cup to create a cup of hot water. Use two Guam leaves, one Marantil, and one Harlander on the cup of hot water in any order to create a three-dosed Guthix Rest. Decant them at Bob Barter to four doses. And a quick note is that adding more herbs than called for will result in a ruined herb tea, so care must be taken in combining these ingredients accurately. Stringing Yu Longbows At 70 fletching, players can make money from stringing complete Yu Longbows. Just put together an unstrung Yu Longbow with a bow string. Additionally, you could choose whether to sell them back in the Grand Exchange or cast high-level alchemy on them, giving you 768 coins each, resulting in 386k profit if you alk them or 259k if you don't. Crafting Dragonstone Jewelry You're able to craft 1,200 pieces of Dragonstone Jewelry per hour by using the Edgeville Furnace, as it is the closest furnace to the bank without requirements. What you want to do is grab gold bars and dragon stones, then click on the Edgeville Furnace and make the jewelry that's the most profitable to make. The prices fluctuate, so I check the prices before starting so you can pick the most yielding item. This method will make you 216k GP per hour, but the most important thing about this method, it will gain you 120,000 crafting experience per hour, making it pretty awesome. Now these next three methods are very similar, but using a different raw material for each. And that is cooking raw sharks for 200k per hour, anglerfish for 250k per hour, and raw carabon for 192k per hour or 630k per hour if you want to tick them. I recommend cooking them at the rogue's den as it's one of the easiest no requirement spots to cook efficiently at. Now, I do want to mention that you can one tick the raw carabons if you're feeling up to a higher intensity gameplay. This is done by clicking on the carabon and then on the fire every game tick, giving you faster cooking experience and making you more GP per hour. Welcome to the PVM section of this video. I'm going to reveal a massive amount of ways you can make GP while PVMing in game. And as a little congratulations and secret gift for making it this far in the video, I'm going to toss one of you guys an Armadel chest plate to help your PVM journey get started. Just comment, full video challenge completed. Hope you guys have been enjoying this far, and let's get into it. Defeating Revenants with a Magic Shortbow This method is geared towards a budget range setup, seeking to minimize risk through the use of a Magic Shortbow, while only bringing in the Amulet of Avarice as the item kept on death through the use of Protect Item. The Amulet grants a 20% boost to accuracy and damage when attacking revenants, allows loot to be dropped in noted form, and keeps the player skulled in order to increase the likelihood of a unique weapon drop. Revenant orcs offer a good balance between the value of their drop table and ease of killing, although the corresponding area of the revenant caves can be fairly busy depending on the time of day. While the expected profits of this method are based on revenant orcs, it is also possible to switch to hellhounds or other monsters within the rev caves. Although this activity can be one of the most lucrative sources of income for all players, who survive being intercepted and interrupted by player killers, it is more beneficial for higher level players. Having all protection prayers available at 43 prayer and accessing the level 89 shortcut increase the chances of survival. Since PKers usually start attacking with magic, it is strongly advised to set protect for magic and protect item as quick prayers before heading into the caves and switch overheads according to their attacks. Also, all Greek or mystic might could help boost up defenses further. With that said, it is not recommended to exhaust all prayer points. Reserving some prayer and a few extra doses of blighted super restore could save you from being smited and make sure you make your average hourly rate of 2.3 million GP per hour. Defeating Remnants with a Crossbow while Scald. This is an option for all of you who are more experienced in PvP and are confident that you will not use your plus one. It's also advised to wait to do this until you're able to confidently escape PKers most of the time, which is done by freezing them and logging out, making yourself a crisp 3 million GP per hour. Defeating Rune Dragons. The average Rune Dragon kill, including its unique drops, is worth 38k. Without the unique drops, the average kill is worth 35k. Rune Dragons yield an hourly profit of 1.5 4 million GP on average. At lower levels and equipment, you might get 33 to 38 kills per hour, while at maximum efficiency, it is possible to obtain 55 to 60 kills per hour. The most common strategy used at Rune Dragons is to pay little to moderate attention using melee. 90 plus combat stats, praying piety and protect for magic, and wearing Justice Shear armor, Dragonfire shield, and Dragon Hunter lance for an average of 45 kills an hour. Rune Dragons have multiple attacks, similarly to Mithril and Adamant Dragons. Along with standard Dragonfire attacks, they have a standard melee, ranged, and magic 
magic attack, as well as two special attacks. The first special attack is two small electric bolts, which are launched around your position and homes in on you. This deals four to seven damage per tick for a few seconds. If you're wearing insulated boots, this damage is reduced to one to two per tick. The second special attack is a ranged attack that hits through protect from missiles. It uses the life leech effect from enchanted onyx bolts, where the dragon will heal itself for 100% of the damage dealt to you. Even the standard attacks are dangerous, consistently hitting in the 20s and 30s. This makes dying a real possibility if not paying enough attention, so you can either heal up or teleport out. Ultimately, when killing rude dragons using protect from magic, wearing insulated boots, and consuming slash equipping things that protect you from dragon fire are essential to killing rude dragons effectively. Now, using defenders increases GP per hour, even with the cost of extended super anti-fires, but most use a dragon fire shield and extended anti-fires because of the higher defensive bonuses and increased block chance. Using Bando's armor and helm of Neznot or Neznot face guard is also higher GP per hour, but most use just as your armor because of its set effect and higher defensive bonuses. Using angler fish is an uncommon strategy. Angler fish allow you to heal above your max HP, allowing you to look away from your screen for longer periods of time without worrying about dying. Angler fish require less attention, but are more expensive while cooked carabon are cheaper but need to be eaten more often. Over time, using angler fish can cost millions more GP than just using cooked carabon. Defeating Lava Dragons Lava Dragons reside on their island in level 36 to 42 Wilderness. A successful kill can take roughly 30 to 60 seconds. They are one of the most lucrative sources of income for high-level players if you could survive being intercepted and interrupted by PK clans. Aside from the dangers involved, you can travel there and safe spot the dragons, and loot can also be telegrammed from outside if you choose not to enter. Additionally, it is not recommended to go anywhere near them since they can easily kill you with their dragon fire breath if you choose a god book over the anti-dragon shield. You have to bring items you're willing to risk, thus wearing only three three to four items is strongly recommended. Anything else should be expendable and easily obtainable like a god cape, book, or achievement diary items. Magic bonuses are not required due to the low magic level of the dragons. Instead, you should take magic strength gear and the rest of your setup as tanking gear. For example, an occult necklace, imbued god cape, and your weapon as your three wrist slot item with black dehyde body and black dehyde chaps in order to tank PKers. At 74 agility or 69 with a summer pie boost, and with the hard wilderness diary completed, an agility shortcut becomes available for quickly accessing the dragons and escaping an onslaught for an overall average of 1 million GP per hour. Next with the team. Doing next with a decent team can make you 13 million GP per hour. This profit rate assumes 10 kills per hour in a 5-man team. A reasonably efficient 5-man team can kill 11 necks per hour. The average drop rate is 1 per 43.23 kills for unique reward. Depending on team speed and size, your personal unique rolls per hour may vary greatly. It is highly recommended to use thralls when fighting necks as they offer a sizable increase in DPS during the fight due to their 100% accurate attacks. Now, under the assumption that all five players are contributing equally towards killing necks, for the four players each with 20% contribution, the drop rate is 1 out of 215 for a unique drop. For the player with the MVP bonus with a 22% contribution, the drop rate is 1 out of 210.78. The chance of at least one of the five players receiving a unique drop per kill is 1 out of 43.23. Unlike the other generals in God Wars Dungeon, Nex has her own room, the Ancient Prison, where she can be reached by first completing the Frozen Door mini quest and then using either an ecumenical key or by collecting 40 essence of her followers. Once enough essence is obtained, you can enter the boss room. For those of you who don't own a Zerite crossbow, Osmopton's fang can be very useful against Nex. However, you should pair it with a ranged weapon for her shadow, ice, and final phases, otherwise you risk taking heavy damage or being unable to reach her. A stab slash crush weapon should be taken in order to break the ice prisons for your allies. Theater of Blood. Most of the profit from Theater of Blood, nearly 90%, comes from the raid's unique drops. The chance of a unique being received is 10.99% for a deathless raid regardless of group size and is decreased for every death and per skipped room. Upon receiving a unique drop, it is given to one of the players in the raid at random, with the MVP having a higher chance. Using a Scythe of Vitor can make 9 million GP per hour doing this method. This profit rate assumes 3 kills per hour in trios with 0 deaths. Your actual profits may be higher or lower depending on your actual KC per hour, your group size, the number of deaths per raid, and luck. 3 kills per hour requires minimal downtime, few mistakes, and efficient strategies. The cool part is, is you don't have to have high-level gear. You can still make 7 million GP per hour with a more mid-level gear setup. This profit rate assumes 2.5 kills per hour in quads with zero deaths. Venonatus. You can make over 6 million GP per hour with a low gear investment by defeating Venonatus. This profit rate assumes you are soloing Venonatus with melee and averaging 26 kills per hour. Venonatus' most valuable drops include the Dragon Pickaxe, Treasonous Ring, Void Waker Gem, Fangs of Venonatus, and Onyx Bolt Tips. Venonatus can attack with all three forms of combat. Whilst you only attack with one combat style at a time, 
If you're in melee distance, you will instead only be attacked by melee. Like Vedion, she is weakest to crush. She will begin the fight by using 8 range attacks, followed by 8 magic attacks, all while moving position every 4 attacks. She will spawn spider links on the first range attack in cycle, and deploy her web attack on the third mage attack in the cycle. This pattern will repeat until Vedinas is defeated. All players who enter the arena will appear to the north, so it is recommended to hang south as much as possible to escape player killers. You should avoid the webs at all costs, as their ability to drain run energy will prevent you from escaping from PKers. The web can be positioned safely by standing on the outskirt of the arena on the third attack to help prevent accidentally walking into the web. Spider Links should be killed as soon as they spawn to prevent them from empowering her too much. Fortunately, they only have 5 health and can be killed in one hit by any combat style. With 94 plus magic, you can use Blighted Ice Sacks to one hit the Spider Links. Leviathan. One of the newest bosses added to Old School Rootscape can grant you 5.8 million GP per hour. Leviathan's most valuable drops include the Venator Ring, Awakener's Orb, Virtus Mask, Virtus Robe Top, and Virtus Robe Bottom, all worth hefty amounts of GP. Leviathan uses a volley of rapid firing attacks, which deal damage upon impact. Protection Prayers will fully block these attacks. Blue Orbs indicate a magic attack, green orbs indicate a range attack, and orange orbs indicate a melee attack. Alongside the orb attacks, Leviathan also utilizes a biting attack that is inflicted as melee damage. Like the orb attacks, Protect for Melee will fully block it, though it has no warning animation. This attack is only used when directly next to the pool and one tile diagonally across from the corners. It may be beneficial to highlight these tiles so they can be avoided when necessary. At the end of each volley, the boss will roar and cause debris to fall around the arena, with one falling down on your location as a permanent spawn for the remainder of the fight. You will take minor unavoidable damage from the roar, but can avoid the debris by moving away from where they stood. Every subsequent volley of attacks will increase in intensity, which can make it difficult to switch prayers at later volleys. It gets faster and faster until you only have a tick to react. At any point during the volley of attacks, you can cast any type of shadow spell to stun the Leviathan, which will always succeed, where it will stay still for 15 ticks. Damage against it is capped at 10 when stunned, but if you can run around to attack its backside to deal a large amount of damage which will cause it to retaliate with a special attack. Leviathan's attack speed will decrease upon being stunned and having lost 25% of its health, so make note of this when the stun is needed. Spindel. This is a version of Venonanus that can make you 4 million GP per hour. Spindel's most valuable drops include a Dragon Pickaxe, Treasonous Ring, Void Waker Gem, Fangs of Venonatus, and Onyx Bolt Tips. This profit rate assumes you are soloing Spindel with melee and averaging 52 kills per hour. Spindel is very similar mechanically to Venonatus, so if you need to learn how to do it, go ahead and watch that section of this guy. Vorkath. One of Runescape's most notable money makers, farmed by a big percentage of the game population. Vorkath can earn you over 3 million GP per hour with 90 plus stats and a Dragon Hunter Lance. Before the fight starts, equip a Bando's God Sword and use one of the special attacks on Vorkath with Piety and Protect for Magic Active. Regardless of whether the special attack hits or misses, equip your Dragon Hunter Lance and Defender and proceed with the fight as normal. Alternatively, Dragon Claws can be used as a special attack weapon, being slightly more effective but also more costly. Protecting for Magic is necessary to prevent Dragon Fire damage from Vorkath, however, due to the high defense melee gear worn in this setup, damage taken from range and melee attacks should be minimal. In the full melee setup, it is possible that your magic attack bonuses may be below 65, which means your Crumble Undead cast will splash on the undead spawn. To prevent this, equip your Bando's God Sword when Vorkath freezes you, then cast Crumble Undead. Alternatively, switch to a Slayer Staff to auto-cast Crumble Undead. As long as your magic attack bonus is above minus 65, you will always one-shot the undead spawn with the spell. You should expect a minimum of 4-6 to six kills per trip with 90 plus combat stats, limited by inventory space, with more being possible with good luck. If you're for some reason looking to extend your kills per trip beyond 6, consider bringing some runes for high-level alchemy to increase your trip length. Callisto. Callisto is a level 470 bear that can be found inside Callisto's den. He is killed for the valuable Void Waker Hilt, Claws of Callisto, Tyrannical Ring, and Callisto Cub. You can expect a 3.2 million GP profit per hour here. As a fair warning, Callisto resides in a multi-way area in a moderately high-level wilderness. You may be attacked at any time during the kill, so do not bring items that you are willing to lose. Callisto can deal incredibly high melee damage through prayer, so melee combat is not advised. Callisto is no longer immune to magic damage, but has a high magic level, so range is the ideal method for doing damage. However, the boss will approach targets constantly, so a method of freezing the boss in place is strongly recommended outside the largest of groups. Spells such as Ice Barrage or Entangle are commonly used. Spells such as Vulnerability, especially when combined with the Tome of Water effect, or even a Dragon Warhammer is sometimes also used to lower its defense. A Charged Web Weaver Bow has a powerful bonus against Wilderness Monsters and can provide the fastest kills, but it carries a higher risk compared to other setups. Callista will spawn to the south of the den, right in front of the exit, leading into the escape caves. If you wish to avoid player killers, it is recommended to place a secondary account waiting outside the entrance to scout 
out potential threats. All players who enter the den will spawn to the north, similar to Venonatus' lair. Now, keep in mind, Callisto uses highly damaging melee attacks and is weakest to range attacks, so it is highly recommended to just range him. A cool trick when fighting Callisto is the first free spell you use will always land if he's not already frozen, but binds after the first are not guaranteed to hit. If he cannot attack with melee, he will begin using a much weaker ranged attack until he can reach his target. Callisto will occasionally launch a white orb at you, of which you can switch to protect for magic or risk taking up to 50 damage from the attack. Upon reaching 66 and 33% of his health, Callisto will roar, launching bear traps all across the arena. Stepping on one will deal up to 15 damage and bind you for a few seconds. The traps will linger around for a short duration before expiring, but will immediately be replaced with a fresh set of traps. While roaring, he will also glow red, breaking free of his binds in the process and requiring you to refreeze him. Arsho. Arsho is another version of Callisto and is very similar mechanically. Arsho can make you 2.7 million GP per hour, but is also in the wilderness, so beware. Zolra. Talking about one of the longest viable money makers in RuneScape history. Zolra is a boss that is endlessly farmed and can make you 1.5 million GP per hour casually defeating it, or up to 2.7 mil an hour with max gear and effort. When Zolra is green, it attacks with range and spreads toxic fumes over the area. It spawns snake links who appear in the arena via white orbs. They have one hit point, but can deal heavy and accurate damage damage. Pray protect for missiles. When Zolra is turquoise, it attacks with magic and range, spreads toxic fumes, and spawns snake links. Pray protect for magic. When Zolra is crimson, it attacks your recent spot. If you're caught by the melee attack, you will also be stunned. Prayer is not required when Zolra is in the crimson form. Towards the end of each attack pattern, Zolra alternates between magic and ranged attacks known as the Jad phase. This phase appears identical to the green phase. Alternate between protect for magic overhead and protect for missile overhead prayers. Vedia. Like all wilderness bosses, you may be attacked at any time during the fight, and death is all but guaranteed in any deep wilderness multi-combat area. Do not bring any items that you are not willing to lose, although grinding Vedion will make you 3.2 million GP per hour. Now, as a quick note, whenever gearing, check your items kept on death and enable Wilderness Beyond level 20 to make sure important items will not be lost. Vedion has the highest defensive capabilities of the three bosses in the wild. However, his negative crust defense of minus 10 makes him fairly easy to hit. All of Vedion's attacks are AoE, meaning that if you avoid them, you can essentially take no damage from his attacks. Vedion will yell quotes whenever he attacks as a fairly easy and simple way to dodge the attack. The shield bash is the only major concern due to its larger AoE, but is still otherwise easy to dodge since it is only used in melee distance. When Vedion reaches 50% of his health, he will summon skeletal hellhounds to assist him in battle. The hellhounds will channel immunity to Vedion until they are killed. While they deal powerful melee hits, they are not durable, with both the normal and greater versions only having 30 health. In the event you are targeted by player killers and are leaving via the escape caves, the fastest exit to level 30 wilderness for a teleport is the southern exit from the caves. However, the northeastern exit is much safer, as teams may wait at the southern entrance to attack players. The northeastern exit is also near a single-way combat zone to lessen the threat. Calvarion Being another version of Vedion, the mechanics are super similar. With the average Calvarion kill being worth 60k GP, you can make a whopping 2.3 million GP profit per hour farming this boss. Demonic Gorillas Demonic Gorillas drop Zenite Shards required to create powerful Zenite Jewelry. Zenite Shards are the large majority of profit for Demonic Gorillas. With the shards dropping at a rate of 1 out of 300, Demonic Gorillas are an inconsistent moneymaker. Despite the shards being valued at 9.8 million GP each, the average Demonic Gorilla kill is worth 51k. While the average profit per hour may be high, actual profit per hour depends greatly on whether Zenite shards are received. If you do not receive a shard, the average kill is worth only 18k coins, and the baseline profit is much lower at 839k per hour. These rates assume you're using decent gear and have higher end stats. However, it is possible to achieve 60 plus kills per hour when on a Slayer task with sufficient arc light charges. The average hourly profit equals out to 2.7 million GP per hour. To defeat a demonic gorilla, you must count your damage output, switch to the correct protection prayer after receiving 3 missed hits, avoid the demonic gorilla special boulder attack, and switch between melee and ranged gear, all while watching for the demonic gorilla's own change in protection prayers, and accounting for the gorilla's current attack style. I only recommend doing this method if you're going to be there for the long haul. Dagonoff Kings. As long as you can consistently kill two kings before the third one responds, it becomes possible to stay for extremely long trips, especially when using the Saradam and Godsword special attack combined with the Lightbearer ring, with the main limitation being poison protection and prayer points making you 2.5 million GP per hour. The response timer makes it impossible to spend less than 45 seconds per kill in the long run or 135 seconds per cycle. This puts an upper limit of 26.6 kills of all three kings, but the actual kills per hour will vary depending on trip length because getting to the dungeon takes so long. Maximizing trip length is critical to maximizing profit, 
Better supplies and fewer switches are worthwhile if they mean longer stays. Flicking rigor and piety can conserve prayer points, further extending trips. If not on task, the Serpentine Helm provides immunity to poison. Additionally, loot management is critical. Bring runes for high-level alchemy, and profit will be noticeably lower without the Fremnik Elite Diary completed. Now here's a quick overview of each king. Dagonoff Prime. The Dagonoff King who uses magical attacks. Whenever he is attacking, protect from magic must be on at all costs, as Prime can hit up to 50 damage and easily kill in two hits. Prime is weak to ranged attacks. Dagonoff Rex. The Dagonoff King who uses melee attacks. He is extremely easy to deal with as he can either be binded or lured to the edges of the island where he can get stuck easily. Dagonoff Supreme. The Dagonoff King who uses ranged attacks. Supreme is also easy to deal with, hitting harder than Rex but lower than Prime. Supreme's attacks can hit multiple players if they are facing his direction. Good luck out there, guys. Lizardmen Shamans. Lizardmen Shamans are Lizardmans that possess the ability to use a few special attacks. They're relatively easy to kill, have decent drops overall, and also the Dragon Warhammer is a rare drop. Kills range between 25 and 30 seconds in the Lizardmen Temple, Settlement, and Caves when on Slayer task. This puts the range at around 100 to 130 kills per hour. The average Lizardman Shaman kill is worth 15k. Excluding the Dragon Warhammer, the average kill is worth 7k. Because of the rarity of the Dragon Warhammer, the approximately 27.7 hours to achieve the average profit per hour of 1.8 million GP is something you should only do if you want to stay here for some time. Lizardman Shamans use the following attacks. A standard melee attack sharing the same animation as the other Lizardmen. Ranged attack. A standard ranged attack sharing the same animation as other Lizardmen. This attack can poison you. Special attacks. Lizardmen Shamans have three special attacks that can be used without cooldown. Acid Spit. The Shaman spits a large ball of acid at your current location. This will deal unblockable poison damage for up to 30 damage. This attack can poison. The damage reduces if you wear a full set of Shazian armor obtained from fighting the soldiers in the combat ring. Wearing the full tier 5 Shazian sets negates all damage done by this attack, though you still can be poisoned. Jump. The Shaman jumps into air before crashing down at your location. This can be avoided by moving out of the way. If the Shaman stops you, you will take heavy damage which cannot be blocked. Spawns. The Shaman summons three spawns, two next to you and one under you, who will follow you upon spawning, unless the spawns are summoned in a position where they cannot see you. After several seconds, the spawn will explode, dealing 8 to 10 damage to you if you were within two spaces or less from it when it explodes. The minion who spawns under you will always explode first. Lizardman Shamans have an attack range of 8, which means that weapons like longbows, composite bows, the crystal bow, and the bow of Faradin can outrange it on rapid, and weapons like shortbows, crossbows, and Kirill's crossbow can outrange it on long range, meaning you can safely kill Lizardman Shamans. Giant Mole. The Giant Mole is a mid-level boss commonly killed for its mole claws and mole skins. These can be given to Weiss and the Gardener in exchange for bird's nests, containing rare seeds and jewelry. The Giant Mole always drops one mole claw and one to three mole skins per kill with an average of two, which can be exchanged one for one into bird's nests. Bird nests are always in demand because they're a secondary herbal ingredient to make Saradam and Bruce. An experienced adventurer can get around 150 bird's nests per hour by killing the Giant Mole. As bird's nests are quite difficult to get through other methods, the Giant Mole is the fastest and most popular source of bird's nests in RuneScape, making it a great mid-level boss to kill and earning you 1.7 million GP per hour. The average loot per giant mole kill is 26k, but most of the loot, 86.9% to be exact, comes from the mole claws and mole skins. Giving these mole parts to Weiss and the Garner in exchange for bird's nests can always be profitable, and having the Faldar Hard Diary task completed gives you two huge benefits. Noted mole claws and mole skin drops, the Faldor Shield Mole Locator, which points an arrow at the minimap to the boss's location at all times. These perks are essential and will boost kill speed from 20 per hour to 50 per hour. In addition, you should always bring an inextinguishable light source such as the Kandoran Headgear 1 Plus, Bullseye Lantern, or either of its variants. The Kandoran Headgear is recommended as it is very easy to obtain. Although if you wanted, those of you that have completed making friends with my arm can light the old fire pit near the entrance of the mole lair. Brutal Black Dragons Brutal Black Dragons are found in the Catacombs of Corin. The average value of one kill is 25k coins, and the average hourly profit is 1.1 million GP. It is recommended to bring one to two prayer potions depending on your prayer level, a divine ranging potion, and an extended anti-fire. Protect from magic should always be activated, or death is certain due to their extremely powerful magic attacks as well as dragon fire. Together, protect from magic and an anti-fire nullify all damage from distance but you need to make sure that both are on simultaneously. Melee damage is still highly damaging, so you should be careful of picking up loot when next to an attacking dragon. You should always restore your prayer and health at your player-owned house or at Ferox Enclave and teleport back using a Xerix Talisman. Restoring at Ferox using a Ring of Dueling is a good option for those of you who do not have an ornate rejuvenation pool. It also can be faster than restoring at a player-owned house since a bank box is right next to the Ferox Pool of Refreshment, eliminating the need to teleport a second time to bank loot from kills. The Pool of Refreshment will remove any stat bonuses as from divine ranging potions, so just be aware. Zolcano. 
Zolcano is a skilling boss located in Prifidus that can make you 1.5 million GP per hour. Zolcano can be killed consistently in three stages while also dispersing the kill contribution and therefore monetary gain evenly when killed in a four player group. Expect to see a slight increase in profits if you are consistently getting MVP in your group which will make you a little bit more money. Killing Commander Ziliana Commander Ziliana is a high-level boss that requires relatively high combat stats and equipment to kill, but gives a steady 4.5 million GP profit. Ziliana is commonly killed for her Armadillo Crossbow and Saradaman Hilt Drops. At higher levels, it is possible to maintain 25 to 28 kills per hour with high concentration or using a Twisted Bow or Tummikin Shadow as the primary weapon. Typical gear includes the Missouri Equipment with Twisted Bow or Tummikin Shadow with Ancestral against Ziliana. A Bullpipe Switch is then used for the minions. A basic solo strategy is, attack Ziliana with your Tummikin Shadow, Armado Crossbow, Twisted Bow, and run around the room. Hug the wall at all times to keep Ziliana following you. Utilize your stamina potions to keep your run energy up. Pray Protect from Magic when killing Ziliana if using ranged, or Protect from Range if using Mage. If done correctly, the only damage you should take is from the range or mage minion, respectively. After Ziliana is dead, kill the melee minion first, then range, then magic. This is to minimize the damage taken. Use the Bullpipe special attack to heal throughout your fight. Killing General Gardor General Gardor can drop the Bandos Hill, Bandos Chestplate, Bandos Tacits, and Bandos Boots. And he and his minions can drop parts of the God Sword. Apart from his unique drops, Gardor also drops a good amount of coins, herbs, and seeds with the total profit per hour averaging at 4.8 million GP per hour. Like the other generals in God Wars Dungeon, he can be reached either by using an ecumenical key or by killing 40 of his followers. This can take up to 10 minutes by killing goblins that are near the arena. Once kill count is obtained, you can enter the boss room. After slaying Grodar, go after his bodyguards. A solo trip can last multiple kills per trip, and it takes around 3 minutes per kill, including respawn time. Killing Kriara Kriara can drop the Armadale Hilt, Armadale Helmet, Armadale Chestplate, and Armadale Chainskirt. He can also drop parts of the God Sword. Apart from his unique drops, Kriara also drops ammunition, potions, and ranging equipment. Most of the profit from killing this boss is in his rare drops, but he is the most profitable of all the three God Wars dungeon bosses besides Nex, coming in at 6.4 million GP per hour. Now, after slaying Kriara, you can Blood Barrage his bodyguards to get health back. You can also replace your Dragon, Armadale, or Zerite Crossbow with a Boa Ferradin to avoid spending money on Diamond Dragon Bolts E and increase your overall profit. This is a very great boss to kill, and I wish you the best of luck there. Killing Green Dragons Green Dragons are monsters found in the wilderness, which always drop Dragon Bones and Green Dragon Hide, which sell for 3.4k and 1.3k respectively. This makes each kill worth 4.7k coins, thus offering you the opportunity to make a good amount of money by killing them and picking up their drops. This old school moneymaker is better than ever, making a steady 850k per hour, and you could do it at low stats. Killing Phantom Musfa Before the fight starts, stand near the cave entrance and wait for the boss to spawn and get ready to make a juicy 3.5 million GP per hour. Pray accordingly to which style the boss is currently using. Remember to summon your thralls when the current one runs out of time, and if you're using the melee step back method, stand approximately 4 tiles east of Musfa's respawn point. Run back and kite the boss if it's using melee to prevent it from attacking you. If you're able to, you can avoid this melee attack entirely by using the step back method, which involves moving away from the boss one tick before its attack animation starts. If Musfa is moving while performing its melee attack, and you have protect for melee activated, it should always hit a zero. Your accuracy will be lower during the melee phases, so you might want to sip a dose of stamina potion if your run energy runs low. A ring of endurance's passive effect will lower the rate at which your run energy drains and doubles the duration of stamina potion doses. However, there will be some kills where your special attack energy hasn't recharged enough to use the Zerat's crossbow special attack on the boss during the prayer shield phase, if you don't wear a light bearer. Best of luck out there, boys. Killing the Corporal Beast The average Corporal Beast kill, including its unique drops, is estimated to be worth around 400 and 60k each. Without the sigils, this value is estimated to be 125k each, with a total average of 2.6 million GP per hour profit. The Corporal Beast attacks with melee and magic. It attacks normally every 4 ticks, but it can occasionally attack 3 ticks after its last. It will use a melee attack 40% of the time, provided you are in melee range. The magic attacks are all equally common with a 20% incidence in melee range, or a 33% incidence outside of melee range. Protect from melee will block all damage from the melee attack, and Protect from magic will block one third of the damage from the magic attacks. Despite this, it is recommended to always use Protect from magic due to the magic attacks higher damage, accuracy, and frequency. And if you happen to pull an Elijah Spirit Shield here at Corporal Beast, you are walking away with some juicy 
profit. Killing Ents. At a high woodcutting level, you make more coins an hour at Ents, not including the bird's nest that they also drop, than actually chopping you trees at Sears Village. You can reach the Ents by teleporting to Corporal Beast Lair via a game's necklace and exiting the cave. From here, you can either safe spot the Ents using the trees and rocks just north of the lair, or the west side of the Chaos Temple for 540k per hour profit. Fosani's Nightmare. Fosani is a great boss to learn and can grant you a steady 3.5 million GP per hour profit. This boss drops a load of high tier items like Inquisitor and all the nightmare orbs like the Harmonized Orb worth over 400 million GP. The chance of receiving a unique item per kill is 1 out of 167. The armor, mace, and staff drop has a 1 out of 200 chance to roll, and the orb drop table has a 1 out of 1000 chance to roll. You should pre-pot with anglerfish and a sip of stamina potion before running over to Fosani's Nightmare from a bank. You should also be familiar with the mechanics from the regular encounter, since all of them will be used on every face. With sufficient experience, little to no damage should be taken in the encounter, with any taken being restored by your Amulet of Blood Fury. The Toxic Blowpipe is crucial for taking down 3 and 4 Sleepwalker spawns. You could use the Crossbow, Chinchampa's Hunter's Crossbow, and Kirill's Crossbow, whose 4 and 3 respective tiles for extra range easily compensate for being 1 tick slower than the Blowpipe. While the Husks and Parasites retain the same health as in normal mode, in this particular encounter, any weapon used on the Crush setting will always result in a maximum hit, regardless of accuracy. With decent strength boosting gear, you can easily max 20s on husks with any weapon, including fun weapons like the Hamjoy and Goblin Paint Cannon, which attack a tick faster than weapons like Inquisitor's Mace, though a mace is more than enough to kill the husks without any swaps. Parasites can be one-shotted if weakened, hit with an Elder Maul in Strength, and an imbued Berserker Ring or Altar Ring. If the Parasite is not weakened, then the damage you take is added on top of its max health, and you will not be guaranteed to max hit on it. The fight plays out exactly the same as the original encounter. Though if you're learning, you will mostly struggle with the extended claws attack, which can deal up to 65 damage per hit, and can easily two hit you if you have slow or delayed reactions. To dodge this attack, you should run a few tiles away from their previous position as the shadows tend to clump around them, usually with one of them always targeted on your position at the time of the attack. Killing Skeletal Wyverns Skeletal Wyverns are Slayer monsters with a high combat level. They require high level gear in 72 Slayer. They are commonly killed for their profitability due to valuable drops such as 35 magic logs, 10 noted battle staffs, and 10 noted adamant bars, in addition to a chance at dragon armor pieces and the elusive draconic visage. The average skeletal wyvern kill, including its unique drops, is worth 18.4k. Without any unique drops, the average kill is worth 17.4k. Melee is the most effective combat style to use against them. I do recommend you have 80 plus attack, strength, and defense before attempting to farm these guys, and if you use melee, you will be exposed to all attacks including an icy breath attack which can freeze. Now, bringing barrows, bandos, or obsidian armor in an abyssal whip is good enough to kill skeletal wyverns as they are equally weak against slashing and crushing attacks, despite being skeletal. But if you want, you can also safe spot them with range, for a very steady moneymaker. Killing Blue Dragons Blue Dragons always drop Dragon Bones and Blue Dragon Hide, which sell for 3.4k and 1.6k respectively. This makes each kill worth a total of 5k apiece. Those of you who have completed Dragon Slayer 2 may prefer killing Blue Dragons in the Myths Guild's basement, as they are much closer to a bank alongside ease of access with the Mythical Cave Teleport. The Dragons can also be attacked safely and effectively with ranged or magic. I recommend having 90 combat or higher if you're going to engage these with melee, and if you're using melee, it is highly recommended for you to bring gear that offers protection against dragon fire, like an anti-dragon shield and an extended anti-fire to make a consistent 540k per hour. You can also safe spot this with range or mage if you so choose. Completing the Gauntlet The Gauntlet is a solo minigame in Prifidus, in which you are given a limited amount of time to explore a randomly generated dungeon layout, gather various resources and supplies by killing and defeating crystalline monsters, all in preparation to defeat the crystalline Hunlith, which is based upon a deadly wolf-like predator from the elven homeworld of Taradad. You cannot bring items within the Gauntlet. A chest can be found by the entrance to temporarily store your items before you enter, which are returned once you leave the gauntlet. In addition, it is classified as a dangerous minigame. Despite not requiring any items to participate, rather it means hardcore Iron Man will lose their hardcore status should they die in the gauntlet. The area contains crystals, roots, herbs, and fish obtainable through mining, woodcutting, fishing, and other gathering methods in order to make weapons, armor, potions, and food. These various resources will not require a specific skill level to gather. The dungeon will also contain various crystalline monsters such as bats, unicorns, and dark beasts, which can be killed for further supplies. Higher level monsters will offer better drops at the cost of taking more time to defeat. Now, completion of the gauntlet will reward you with various loot, including crystal armor seats for crystal armor, the enhanced crystal weapon seed, and crystal shards, 
to charge the previous items. Failing to finish either by death or leaving early will give a small token reward based on how well you performed, but won't grant you any chance of unique items. The average gauntlet completion is worth 241,000 coins. Now, while the average profit per hour may be high at 1.7 million GP, the actual profit per hour depends greatly on whether crystal seeds are received. If you do not receive a seed, an enhanced armor or weapon, the average kill is worth only 72k, thus making the profit only 506k coins per hour if you go on a large dry streak. The Corrupted Gauntlet The Corrupted Gauntlet is similar to the normal gauntlet, which is harder and more profit per hour at a huge 4.8 million GP per hour steadily. Barrows the GP per hour here at Barrows depends on how many chests you can get. One chest is worth around 91k, with Mortania Hard Diary complete. With max gear and stats, you can complete upwards of 15 chests an hour, earning you around 690k profit without any rare drops and 750k per hour on average with rare drops. The Barrows minigame is a mid to high level combat money making method. The game takes a few tries to learn, but in the long term rewards are worth the effort. The goal is to slay all 6 brothers, gather the appropriate kill count in the tunnels, and then loot the Barrows chest. A single run could take anywhere from 3 minutes to 30 minutes depending on your level, though the most common strategy involves banking at the Ferox Enclave and using the rejuvenation pool there after each chest. This leads to 5 minute runs and far more efficient gold per hour due to using less supplies. Killing Gargoyles Killing Gargoyles can bring in a steady income while AFK when you're wearing a full set of Gotham's armor. Gargoyles have the chance to drop granite mauls and dark mystic tops. Depending on luck, methods, and stats, expect anywhere from 200k and 600k profit per hour. Although 70 attack and strength will suffice at the expense of slower kills, it is strongly recommended to possess at least 82 defense if using the AFK Guthans method. Also, bear in mind that the gargoyles are weak to crush. But if you only want defense experience, you have to use the block style, which is stab with Guthans War Spear, making gargoyles an incredibly good AFKable moneymaker. Chambers of Zeric. The Chambers of Zarek is a scalable encounter in that the team stats upon starting the raid will determine the strength of the enemies and quality of resources found inside. Each raid consists of three floors, two floors of randomly generated rooms, and the last floor which contains the Great Alm, the final boss of the raid. The combat rooms are Vespula, Tecton, the Mutadiles, Vasa, Vanguards, Skeletal Mystics, Lizardman Shamans, and Guardians. Puzzle rooms are Crabs, Tightrope, Ice Demon, and the Corrupted Scavenger. Energy pools can be found scattered throughout the raid at three rooms, scavengers, resource, and at the end of the floor for the first two floors. These pools, when interacted with, will fully restore run energy. The end of each floor also updates the respawn checkpoint if you die during the raid. An example is, if you died on the last floor, you would respawn at the last room on the second floor. If you die on the first floor, you'll be placed back at the beginning of the raid. Chambers of Xerix is one of the most engaging pieces of content in old school RuneScape, and if you learn how to do this well, you can make a whopping 8.8 million GP per hour, being one of the biggest money makers in game. Tombs of Amaskir Tombs of Amaskir is the third raid released by Jagex and OSRS. This raid consists of five rooms with the difficulty being determined by the invocations you pick. The path of Atmikin, consisting of a wave-based combat room before the guardian of Atmikin, Baba. He hits you with devastating melee hits and is the boss that kills the quickest, uneven slight mistakes. Path of Krondis, starting with a water puzzle to test your pathing and then you have to fight the guardian of Krondis, Zebak. His fight consists of incredibly specific pathing due to poison spots in the ground and having to roll and hit urns to create safe tiles for you to stand on a time limit. The path of Scarabaraz consists of five puzzles. Four individual puzzles and one last puzzle with tiles on both sides you must match to make it to the Guardian of Scarabus. Kefri's fight consists of dodging Vorkath-like fireballs while dealing with titles being taken away from you. Many different types of minions and stopping Kefaris healing before it becomes too tanky. The last path, Path of Het. Path of Het requires you to do a puzzle with light and mirrors to bounce from one statue to another, with randomly placed walls creating a different layout each run. This path leads to the Guardian of Het, Akka. Akka's main mechanics are to use his protection prayers, requiring you to use the style he wants you to. His shadows must be hit every 20% health you take, forcing you to a corner of the room and acting as a DPS check until he is at the next 20% mark. He can use a memory special and use an orb special to create an orb over every tile you walk on. Outside of solo encounters, he can also detonate, causing damage to players standing in the same row or column as you in a plus sign shape. The last boss is the Wardens, the Guardians of the Tombs. They have three phases, phase one which deals unavoidable damage and should be finished quickly, phase two with many special attacks requiring good movement, 
and decent melee gear to hit on the core when it's down. After the core is down, it goes to phase three, where they summon two bosses from the rooms you've previously defeated and make your pathing to not take damage and tile specific. Possibly an incredibly hard raid or an incredibly easy raid, it all depends on your invocations. TOA comes in at the second best money maker in the entire game, with the highest level experts making 17 million GP per hour profit. This is something every RuneScape player should learn. Vardovis. Vardovis uses a standard melee attack. Protect for melee will reduce roughly 75% of the damage, while he will heal for 50% of the damage dealt from his auto attacks. Alongside this, he also has several special attacks that are more often used simultaneously as the fight progresses. In addition, Vardovis' strength and defense level scale linearly with his remaining hit points. As his health falls, his defense level will lower, making him easier to hit, but his strength level will increase, thus increasing his max hit. Vardovis uses the following special attacks at random. As the fight progresses, he will begin to use multiple simultaneously. Swinging Axes The Strangler's Tendrils will swing one or two axes within the area. Getting hit with this attack will deal up to 17 damage, or up to 35 if you're not praying against it correctly and additionally incurs a bleeding effect over the course of 14 ticks, which deals 15 plus damage. Darting Spikes Vardovis will dart around you, causing cracks in the ground which will release tendrils after a few seconds, dealing up to 25 damage and healing him for half the damage dealt. Head Gaze Once below 80% health, the Strangler's tendrils will begin to use Vardovis' head to launch a single green projectile. While this attack deals no damage, getting hit by it unprotected will disable your protection prayers for 3 ticks, as well as drain 10 prayer points. Strangle Once below 80% health, Vardovis will begin using his attack in which he strikes his arm into the ground and entangle you in tendrils. Several spores will appear at the center of the game screen, and you must destroy them all within 5 seconds, otherwise the tendrils will tighten and deal high damage. Vardobus is an insanely good moneymaker, bringing in a 7.6 million GP hourly profit rate. Duke Succulus Upon entering the prison, Duke Succulus is initially asleep and must be weakened with Ardor Muca poisons, made from resources found within the asylum. Ardor Powder, Muska Powder, and Salex Salt, making this poison require 6 portions of each, and 2 poisons are required to wake the Duke up, so 12 of each will be needed in total. After acquiring 12 Salex Salt, Ardor Powder, and Muska Powder from the left, right, and middle of the arena, Place them in both fermentation vats, and let it ferment for several seconds before collecting two finished poisons. The Sleeping Duke Succulus has a tolerance meter of 200. One Ardor Musca poison will deal 125 damage. You may alternatively feed him mushrooms or its powdered variant which deal 5 damage. Once the bar is completely filled, he is forced to wake and significantly weaken for you to properly fight him. When in melee range, including diagonally across, Succulus will raise his arms, causing icicles to spike up from the ground, immediately dealing low but very accurate chip damage, up to 11 if you are standing on or adjacent to them. Protect from melee reduces the damage to around 5. You will then slam down and shatter the icicles shortly after raising them. This deals significantly more damage up to 56 or around 30 if Protect from Melee is used. If outside of melee range, Succulus will instead launch a blue projectile, which deals up to 48 damage if not protected against. The damage only applies upon impact, so it is possible to activate Protect from Magic before it hits to reduce damage, though it still hits higher than the Icicles attack. Duke Succulus has two special attacks, Freezing Gaze. After every fifth auto attack, he will focus his gaze on you. If you are not standing directly behind a pillar a few seconds after the attack is initiated, you would take high damage up to 101. This is almost assured to kill you, so avoiding it is essential. Gas Flare He will launch gas from his mouth towards a vent near you, leaving dangerous gas there for a few seconds. The gas deals up to 10 damage, which can be reduced with a Slayer Helmet or Gas Mask. Avoid them when moving to the opposite pillar. Duke is another extremely fun boss that I highly recommend you take the time to learn. And if you do, you'll be walking away with 5.2 million GP average profit per hour. And that's 100 ways to make GP in old school RuneScape. Here's a load of special mentions that I did not cover that I feel are extremely viable as well. I hope you guys enjoyed, and if you did, come let me know on Discord and live and stream.